Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 423. Today, we're talking about how do you know if you're ready, if you deserve a black belt? And I'm joined by a guest who posed that very question. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I host the show. And I founded Whistlekick. And I love martial arts in all forms. I'm a traditional martial arts fanatic, and I spend maybe a little bit too much time talking about martial arts. But at the end of it, you get this show, and hopefully you enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, head on over to whistlekick.com and show us that you enjoy it. Follow us on social media, subscribe to the newsletter, make a purchase in the store. If you make a purchase, use the code podcast15 to get yourself 15% off that you can use that as many times as you want. Share it with people. I don't care. <laughs> it helps us know that the podcast is having an impact. So We'll give you 15% off to know that. The website for the show is a little different. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Yeah, there, there are links between the two sites. But you go there, you're going to get transcripts, you're going to get photos, links, all kinds of stuff for the guests and the episodes of this show. Now, the guest on today's show, Mr. Jim Angelo, reached out over email and had a question. He was unsure about testing for his black belt in judo. He wasn't sure that he deserved it. And the way he phrased it just made me think, you know what? This would be a great episode. We've never really dug into this subject. And I could talk about it, but at the same time, it's been a while since I wasn't a black belt. So I thought maybe having a conversation and exploring the topic together might make more sense. Well, of course, he was kind enough to agree. We scheduled, and this is the conversation that came of it. Hope you enjoy it. Mr. Angelo, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. It is a pleasure to have you here. We have, I think this is like kind of the second or third time that we've done this. We, You wrote in with a question, and I was kind of a jerk. Instead of just answering your question, I said, how about you come on the show and I'll answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the the short answer is um, an email would have been really long, and we can probably wrap it up in just a couple minutes in a conversation between us. Probably, probably. But you asked a great question, and it, and to be fair, it was a question that I wasn't quite comfortable just rattling off. You know, a one sided answer. I felt like it needed a little bit of back and forth because the question that you're posing requires me to remember a time pretty pretty long ago for me. And, and it didn't feel fair to, to do that on my own. So why don't you tell the listeners, what was that question, that subject that you brought forward? All right. Could I take a second and set this up? Absolutely. Uh, who I am a little bit? Okay. By all means, uh, please. I am a almost 55-year-old judo practitioner. I started doing that at around 31 years old, uh, was active for some time, earned a brown belt, and then dropped out because family injury career. And uh, I resumed uh, a few years back because I found uh, my passion had never waned uh, in that time frame. I just didn't practice, but I had an interest in it. And so I entered back in uh, at 51 years old, much slower than I used to be. And so now I'm moving upper. Uh, in the ranks, and I am what is known as an EQ, uh, the highest brown level, the next belt level is a showdown. And my question to you, uh, and I i didn't know how to pose this, didn't know where to, you know, um, ask different people how to, what I should think of this. Uh, it's kind of a, a very interpersonal matter to me, but am I worthy of the next level of a black belt? And what does it mean to earn that black belt? And it uh, kind of goes back to my teenage years when I first saw Black Belt Magazine and I saw all these uh, guys with cringed faces getting punched uh, on the cover. And I thought anybody that wore a black belt was a real tough guy and, and uh, was uh, superhuman. And now I'm learning that perhaps that's not true. And I, I question whether or not I'm qualified to wear that belt. Yeah, it's a long answer, but 
that that's what really my question was. But it's a great question and it's an important question. And it's one that we, you know, we've kind of dabbled in. We've talked about it a little bit. And of course, there's a really short answer that I could give you here. Don't worry about it. Once you earn your rank, you'll understand it'll make more sense than uh, a black belt means different things in different schools and different styles. Trust your instructor. Sincerely, Jeremy. Right. I could have sent you that email and it wouldn't have been wrong, but it doesn't go into the nuance. It doesn't delve into the psychology of where you're at, because I'll be very honest. I don't remember a ton of things of my time training 14, 15 years old. I earned my black belt at 16. But I do remember that feeling. I remember exactly what you're talking about. To look at my instructors and these other amazing martial artists that I'd met and see their skills and say, how in the hell can you tell me I deserve to wear this rank when that's what they're doing? It exactly. felt false. Yeah. That's I felt, what I'm struggling with a little bit. Yeah. I remember feeling like a fraud, even, even initially after I, I received my black belt. To go to class and, and to, to line up in that spot and have people coming up to me and congratulating me and, and treating me differently and, you know, an article going in the newspaper. Because let's face it, if there is one universally, near universally uh, lauded um, standing outside of academic pursuit, it is a martial arts black belt. Yeah. I don't see people talking about, you know, their marksman awards in, in shooting. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't see people talking about Eagle Scouts in Boy Scouts the same way people talk about a black belt in martial arts. It's something that everyone seems to understand as being a big deal. Now, maybe they don't understand why it's a big deal. Maybe they don't understand what goes into it. But culturally, at least in the United States, we have this universal praise for a, a it's often the first qu question you're asked right uh when when somebody finds out that i train in judo the very first question is are you a black belt mm -hmm. and and it almost makes me feel as if i'm unqualified to lead in judo if i'm not a black belt and that's where i'm struggling like well i've gone to competitions and i've lost two people in lower rank than me so how do I deserve a black belt? Right. Right. And I think that the thing that we have to talk about first is what does it mean to be a black belt? And mm -hmm. spoiler alert, there's no one answer. And this is the challenge that a lot of people have. And if you look at the roots of a tremendous number of online, hateful martial arts conversation, it comes down to rank and a disagreement over what rank means. You can look at someone who, you know, claims eight, ninth, 10th degree black belt and other people will critique them, not generally because their martial arts is terrible, but because they look at that and this individual doesn't seem to uphold the standard that they would imagine they would be at for that particular rank. Yeah. yeah. Now, in your experience, you talked about Black Belt Magazine and these larger-than-life figures on the cover. What other experiences, what experiences in person did you have, either at that time or in your first stint of judo with Black Belts? What, what formed your personal view of what a Black Belt is? I think my... I imagined somebody that was able to beat everybody up. That was my first indoctrination to it and maybe that's the wrong aspect of it but when you're a kid and you're trying to protect yourself and i graduated high school in 1982 and the way for uh me to deal with things uh, and just about every student back then was to defend yourself if the bully came up and and i saw it as a way of i'm going to get a black belt and i'm going to be able to defend myself against the tough guy bully that was my first impression of what it really meant. And I started uh, late teens to 
try uh, some different styles of karate, uh, little Tang Sudo, little Taekwondo. I would earn a yellow belt and drop out of it. It just didn't appeal to me for some reason. Uh, but I wrestled a very, very little bit in high school. And I learned really quick that I thought wrestlers were really, really good athletes and probably some of the toughest people that I knew. And finally, uh, at about 30 years old, I called one of the local high schools to see if they had an adult wrestling program. And uh, that coach said, well, no, we don't teach adults, but there's judo. So this is in like 1993, 1994 right at the onset of the UFC and Hoist Gracie doing everything he did with BJJ to bring that to the uh, forefront of everybody. So I was like, well, I don't want to do judo because I, I don't want to punch and kick. I want to do grappling. No, judo is more grappling than there is no punching and kicking. Go to the local YMCA. Here's the instructor. And that was my uh, indoctrination to it. And I saw these guys doing moves that I just was fascinated with without all the as I put it at one time, uh, ballerina stuff. And I just like getting on the mat and rolling around. And so when I saw them doing that, that was my, my, uh, my first thing. My, it was like dating a, a girl to me. I'd gone out with so many different girls, different styles of karate. I finally found the one that I wanted to marry. And that was judo. And I, I stuck with it again, was active at it, participated, I uh, went to a national tournament as a 32-year-old. Uh, Didn't do too bad. I was a brown belt at that point, and I went up against uh, Sandan, a third-degree black belt, and I didn't. I lost, but I held my own. And shortly after that, about a year, I injured myself, and that was the end of it. And then I tried staying in uh, shape by uh, weightlifting and you know different things, you know, aerobic uh, activity and whatnot, running a little bit. But it was always I was always drawn back to judo. I always stayed in touch with, with the guys. And it was just such a great workout. It was fascinating to me uh, how I could walk out of a gym feeling so exhilarated, having learned something, and got that anaerobic workout that judo gives you, uh, those short bursts of energy. And so that's really what did it for me. I just saw the energy and the fitness level of these people. And I, I really learned that grappling for three and four minutes at a time is one heck of a workout. And uh, to this day, I still uh, get such joy out of training three days a week and walking out of there feeling like I really accomplished something. So that was really how I got started in it. Ironically, uh, my very first judo instructor, uh, if I can mention his name, Gerald Wee here in Michigan, recently passed away. Uh, he's the guy that got me started in it and, uh, 65 years old, he ran into some health issues and just, uh, three days ago passed away. So, um, it's kind of ironic that we're having this conversation about my, my favorite sport right now on the heels of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully we can, we can do a little bit of justice to his legacy and the fact that you're here now having this conversation possibly inspiring others to take up, if not judo, other martial arts, or, you know, to try something out because of his selflessness in teaching you and others. You know, it's, it's that, it's that cycle, that continuation. And, and to that point, that's another thing that I really found out about a lot of uh, the judo players in the Michigan area. It's not the corner dojo in the strip mall. They are, doing this for zero money in a school gym or in a YMCA that doesn't pay anything because they really have a passion for the art. They're not in it to make money. I've learned that over 20 years of the judo team in Michigan. They, they're in it because of the art, not because they're going to make a buck at it. I sometimes, and I heard Jimmy Pedro, actually, when you mentioned that uh, conversation that you had with him, uh, he talked about that a little bit, if I recall, that uh, um, they, sh they should be looking at it for, uh, as a profit business, and, and they don't. They're just really, really dedicated to the martial art. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have a lot of people like that. And, and certainly, I, I'm, I'm not one who, who is ever going to discredit someone for teaching martial arts 
for money. I'm I'm a you know I'm as I'm as big a capitalist as you get. Absolutely. And in a political way, I mean that if you have a skill that other people are willing to pay for, you absolutely should should charge for that. Everybody's happy yeah. in that equation. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who find that it is easier for them based on what's important to them. And, and we're gonna we're gonna tie these these notions together in a moment to teach for free or for you know basically just trying to cover their expenses insurance yeah. and, and whatnot because they feel it allows them to have a different mindset when they teach and neither is wrong neither is right right it's, everyone has the right to teach the way that they want to teach and everyone has the right to learn the way that they want to learn and hopefully the student and the instructor can find each other and then everybody's happy that works yeah. out yeah Yes, I agree with that. And so that's what I want to tie together is that that individuality, that individuation of what martial arts can be to you, to me, to anybody listening, including what that rank of black belt can signify. Because we all know there are schools out there where you can earn a black belt in three, two, even a single year. But there yeah. are also other schools, other styles Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example, is known for being typically a longer promotional cycle. Uh, eight to 10 years is what I've been told from a number of people yeah. average to earn a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, yeah. the belt that you might put on could be exactly the same. They're both black belts. Now, of course, we're talking about different styles, most likely. Certainly different schools. But of course, what that black belt signifies can be both very similar and very different looking at it in those two contrasting ways. Now, when you talked about your history and, and what, your, what it sounds like your definition of a black belt is, I suspect somewhere, probably in your, in your younger years, you found some extreme value in the ability to defend oneself. You know, Maybe it has something to do I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate and play therapist here for a moment. Maybe it has <laughs> something right, to do though. with your relationship with your father. Maybe you witness somebody important to you um, be assaulted, something like that. Somewhere young, you placed a a very large value on one's ability to protect oneself. No question. Okay. And so, as you got older, and you're looking at martial arts and and yeah pretty much everybody looks at martial arts and sees at least a component of martial arts to be self defense so you start looking at what is held up as the standard of the martial artist the black belt should be able to be really tough should be able to kick some butt if push right. comes to shove if need be and now here you are on the dawn of your earning a black belt and you mentioned you've lost in competition to people who were lower ranked than you. So completely blowing yeah. up this archetype that you've built for yourself of what a black belt is. And that's where the introspection comes in. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you're certainly not the first person, right? I, I, I've lost to plenty of people of, of all ranks. I've had white belts kick me in the head. I've had people who have, you know, even regardless of, of rank, have trained far less than I have wiped the floor with me. Mm. The ego can be such an interesting thing because it can, it can provide fuel. It can provide motivation. If we use ego in a healthy way, it can help us get better. But it can also be another edge of that same sword and really hinder us. You know, it, how how effective is it to grab a sword by the blade? And and to me, that's kind of what ego is 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 holding onto it. You hold too tight, and you hurt yourself. You want to hurt yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, that's you, exactly what I suffered through, uh, because I I did lose to somebody in April, actually, uh, two belt levels lower than me, and I thought, why am I? Sensei is asking me to test for Shodan, and I just lost to somebody. Mind you, he was 30 years younger than me, uh, but... <laughs> that matters. I did, 
It does matter. Well, it, it, I know that. <laughs> I suppose it should matter to me, but it was just a matter of, am I worthy? I just started asking that question. It, it, am I supposed to beat somebody lower ranked than me because I'm on the cusp of earning a showdown? And, and I, I, so that's when I posed the question to you. And then I started asking uh, uh, an Aikido uh, sensei that I know. And uh, when I brought this up to him, his answer was similar to yours and it, and it made sense to me. Uh, he says, you'll never feel worthy of it because that's what a martial artist is. And that kind of sunk in a little bit. I thought, okay, I don't have to be able to do everything perfectly. And then I do a little bit more reading and research. And I think a lot of people equate earning the black belt, uh, like a bachelor degree. And you, you understand the basics pretty good. And now the real learning begins. It's a great analogy. So I'm kind of coming to terms with that. Yeah. Now, I think I've said this on the show before. I, I know I've said this in, in offline conversation. Martial arts rank has to be about more than physical skill. It has to be. Now, here's why. Because if it's not, then we have to start demoting people as they get older. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that, that's kind of how I envisioned it to be. So that, that's a very valid point. If martial arts is about personal development, a black belt rank signifies a number of things. And I, I, I don't want to say that these are universal, but I'm, I'm going to say that they're darn close, if not universal. It signifies a dedication to your training and at least somewhat to your, your school, your instructor, your fellow students, and yourself. And through that dedication, you have achieved an advancement in skill. You know, everybody's starting point is different. Everyone's physical capacity is different. But you have progressed in some way. Now, I've been fortunate enough. I've been able to train in a number of schools. I've been able to earn black belts in multiple schools, multiple styles. And some of those times I've trained alongside other people and tested with others who have also earned their black belts. And what that black belt signifies for me is different than what it signifies for them if we look at it in terms of progress and skill. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you brought up age, you brought up injury, you brought up, you know, kind of physical capability. So I feel like it's, it's fair game to address. At 55, what you're going to be most, more than likely, because, you know, there, there, there's certainly, there, there's variances, there are, there are outliers. Um, I'm thinking of, of a gentleman that I, I used to do CrossFit with who at 55 um, was in better shape than just about anybody else I've ever known in my lifetime. I mean, an mm, utterly wow. f- a phenomenal athlete. Most of us... That's by an the time, outlier. <laughs> yes, he, he... Alan was definitely an outlier. When we think about how we age and, and just physical changes... It's real. It's something that we, we have to understand is there. So does that mean that at 75 years old, someone walks into a martial arts school and says, I would like to train. And the instructor says, nah, you're too old. Get out. Because you're Correct. never right. going to be able to. Of, of course. Not. Now, there's probably some jerk or several jerks out there who would say that. But mm-hmm. I, I think the majority of people listening and, and you sound like you're agreeing. No, because we can always get better. Wherever we're at, we can always get better. Valid. Yes. That helps me understand it a lot better and reconcile it with myself because I questioned it. And I questioned it last night when I left the dojo uh, again, you know, maybe because I was leading up to a conversation about it, but you you know, I got I got pinned by a blue belt, but he's 27 years old. He's half my age. Now, what's but I gave him a little run for his money, and, uh, but I walked out there thinking, how am I supposed to put on a black belt in the next six months after I test for it, after this guy just pinned me? 
come on, you need to be better than that. And it sometimes is a fight within myself. And that, I guess that goes back to your ego point. Let's imagine that in an hour long training session, let's say the two of you showed up to class, you and this, this half your age blue belt. And the instructor said, you know, I, I had the wrong food for dinner. I'm going to have to step out. I'm not feeling well. How about you guys train together, help each other out, make it instead of one of you leading the class in a formal way, work together, practice together. Sure. Now, in that scenario, I could imagine that there might be some things that this younger gentleman is helping you with that you're learning from him. But I suspect that it's probably 80-20 he's going to be picking up stuff from you. You have life experience. You have martial arts experience. You have a better understanding of technique and probably a better understanding of how to teach those techniques, how to apply those techniques. And while he may have vitality that you don't have, he may be able to you know, heal up from an injury better than, than you or, or I can at our ages. Yeah. I bet you could fill his training time that hour with more than his brain is going to be able to take on. And I think that yeah. that is the key. Now, not every martial arts school has a formal designation of when teaching starts. Some do. And those that do, it tends to be at different times. I bet if push came to shove, you could probably substitute teach at your school. Yeah. And I think that... Yeah, but in, a, in, a, in a small manner. Yes. Yeah. As needed. Yeah. You have enough knowledge that you can help others advance. Now, in theory, yeah. everybody ha- can, can look back. You know, your, your second day of class, you should be able to share something with people on their first day of class. But you've got enough under your belt, literal and figuratively, right? Enough hours, probably enough sweat, salt, maybe some fraying going on on that belt that signifies the time that you've put in and how far you've progressed. Yeah. And I've heard plenty of instructors say over the years that they don't promote people when they've met all of the standards, they promote them when they feel that they will be able to grow into all of the standards. Not every school is doing that way. Mm -hmm. You know, there Mm -hmm. are some schools that you don't put on a white belt day one. You, there are things you have to accomplish to put on a white belt, but the majority of schools day one, you are considered a white belt, even if you're not literally wearing one. Right. And that, that can kind of set a tone and, I think that's pretty significant. What do you think? I agree with that. And I'm probably selling myself a little short. And I think that's probably because I'm competitive within myself and I just want to be as good as I can be. And uh, I suppose not wanting to have something handed to me. And you had a guest on, if I can uh, cite this a little bit. Please. Maybe a week ago I heard this. And I think he's probably, he just, I think his first name was Chris and his last name started with a G, I believe. Uh, and he's been practicing martial arts for 50 years. Uh, he has a beard. Um, do you recall who I mean? Um, gosh, I'm, I'm looking it up now. Uh, uh, I, give me, give me one moment. This is the advantage. This is why I keep my phone nearby. It was I just heard the interview maybe about a week ago. Um, uh, Chris something or other uh, starts with a G. It was in the one of the 400 range uh, episodes. Come on, website. And he just celebrated 50 years, I believe. Mm. Uh, Sifu Chris Gertica. Yes, yeah. that's it. And he had made a comment within your discussion about black belts being given out and it watering down the martial art, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of stuck with me. And I thought, well, that's 
what I don't want to appear. That's that, that, that's what I'm afraid of. I don't want to appear that, well, let's, you know, uh, promote this man because he's been here forever kind of thing. I think I'm a pretty good judoka. I do have some knowledge. Uh, I've won. I've lost. I train. I teach. I do all, everything that you had discussed. But for some reason, I still hang on to this. Am I worthy of it? And wanting to be able to uphold it because it it really is such a respectable uh, attainment for me uh, that I, I just don't, I want I want to uphold it if that makes sense to its yes. highest respect. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think I think that of all of the reasons that someone could question you know, their own place in martial arts, this is probably the most honorable, the place of the most integrity because you so greatly value the arts, the rank, and the other people who are participating that you want to be authentic. And I think that that is, uh, that's amazing. It's, it's tremendously important. Thank but you. I, uh, you're welcome. But I suspect that you are, in a sense, kind of keeping score and giving far more <laughs> weight to the things that you see as, as negative or detrimental in your training than you are. You're right there as well. Kind of positive. And you probably do that in life in general. I, I certainly do that. Um, yes, I do. So if, if nothing else, I mean, we've, we've talked about a number of different ways that you can look at this, that you can approach this. There's another one that we haven't mentioned. And, and it, it um, it's the, it's the one that I've been told <laughs> uh, multiple times in my training career, but just just trust the instructor. They they know you. Yeah, your instructor knows you, knows your school, knows how far you have come, and knows what it's like to be a shodan, a black belt in that school. Knows what the other side of that threshold looks like, and you might be able to watch it but you don't understand it in the same way. And so there's a, there, it requires a bit of surrender, a bit of blind faith. Mm. Not just in this individual who would be promoting you, but in yourself and your own ability to grow into that role and hopefully someday feel like you deserve it. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest. There are times I feel like a complete and utter fraud as a martial artist. Wow, really? And I suspect that the vast majority of us feel like that at times. Absolutely. There are times where I'm, I'm on an interview and I'm speaking with someone and we're talking about martial arts, we're talking about something, and I realize I haven't trained in a week. So, to be honest, sometimes that week is longer. Yeah, sure. And I take a step back and I realize, you know what? Whether I'm wearing that belt or not, I could show up to class and not put my belt on. I am the exact same person. I have the exact same capabilities. It's not magic. It's not a cape. It's not, you know, my Iron Man suit as much as I like to think of it as such. Yeah. It's a piece of fabric. And yeah. whether it takes me a year to earn it, and I didn't deserve it, or it takes me 40 years to earn it. And I, you know, I, I most would say that, you know, I had deserved it prior, doesn't change my skill. And I, I find the black belt rank, and we even did an episode that I believe we called the paradox of rank. There is nothing more paradoxical in the martial arts than rank. That's right. Yes. So how do you feel now? Well, I feel like this has been a, like I can get off the couch now. Uh, it was therapeutic for me, and it, it helps me believe in me more. Good. You should believe in and me. Will give me. And will give me uh, the, the desire and the purpose to move forward with this, because I've been prolonging it. I've been putting it off oh. because I... Uh, honestly, and, 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 and because 
there's that expectation. Oh, he's a black belt, you know? Um, so I, I, I guess because I thought, well, I couldn't live up to it, then I'll just prolong it. The expectation isn't there because he's a brown belt. I put on a white belt. I just started Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, one year ago because I thought it would really enhance, you know, judo, so we do a lot of stand-up, right, and takedowns. But the ground game uh, is not near what the BJJ guys uh, uh, commit to. Right. So I thought, well, I really need to enhance that part of uh, my judo. So I put on a white belt and I go to a BJJ class. And it's, a, it's so humbling to me. And I entered a tournament uh, just it was actually July 7th was I, I planned on going and I had uh, was ambitious with my uh, weight loss and, and thought, okay, I, I will re- register for a 225 weight class and um, I've got a month to lose 10 pounds. Well, then it boiled down to, well, you've got two weeks to lose 10 pounds. And lo and behold, I weighed in at 235. So they DQ'd me. Mm. Uh, but I, but I went in with the intention that what have I got to lose? I'm a white belt. I'm a 54 year old white belt. I've got nothing to lose. There's no expectation. Now, if I put on the judo brown belt with two stripes on it, I feel, well, there's an expectation and I probably shouldn't feel that there's an expectation regardless of the belt. But what's the only expectation that matters? Uh, it's your own, right? I was I, just going to say it's my own that I'm learning, picking something up. I'm doing what I love and what I want to do, right. and I've got a passion for it, period. That's I all could, that matters to me. I could expect that you can fly. doesn't change reality. Yeah, yeah. My expectations only are, are only relevant and impactful to you if you put weight in them, if you put any stock in them. Yeah, your, absolutely. Your, your instructor are relevant because you, by definition, value your instructor. That's why you're there. But at the end of the day, it's really you, you're the one that determines whether or not those expectations matter. So if if you can, I'm going to suspect. I'm going to guess, and we can we can wind down here. I'm going to guess that if you can figure out how to be content where you're at in your martial arts, with your rank, with 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 how you approach competition, any of these other aspects that you will find some peace and some non-martial aspects of your life. So, uh, the sure. way, everyone I've ever known, the way they live is the way they train. We don't stop being that. who we are when we start training. So all of our, our assets, all of our liabilities come into training. And as you work outside, you're inside gets better as you work inside your non-martial arts life gets better that's a comforting thought for me and and okay. and talking through this at this length uh really pays off to to speak to somebody that has experienced this i'm very close with my instructor uh but i i, I haven't gotten into this kind of great detail about it because i've been avoiding it <laughs> and <laughs> and what you don't want to pursue you avoid, and I've avoided discussing it because I never felt qualified and ready for it. But you, you've given me a different uh, approach to it, Good. and so I thank you for That's that. The goal. You're welcome. You're welcome, and I thank you for your your trust in me and and the honor of bringing this question forward. And your willingness to to do what we might look back and call martial arts therapy episode one. Mar- <laughs> I, you know, that's exactly what I was going to call it. And when I say I got to get up off the couch, I, I can't really mean that because yeah. I, 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 I Googled, you know, and put the question in Google, what does it mean to be a black belt? Did, <laughs> you know, did your computer blow up. <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there and there's a lot of different theories on what it means. And, and, uh, so that's why I posed it to you because I value what you're bringing to your martial arts community. Oh, thank you. And I, I think that you're insightful and, uh, I think that your guests younger and, or maybe older, maybe this conversation, because now we, we've interviewed for it, 
may help somebody else that might struggle with the same thing. And that was my hope as well. You know, and, and I, I think that we, we approach this from a number of different angles. We've given people uh, a bunch of ways that they can look at it. And hopefully, because I still feel that this experience, this feeling is fairly universal. Everyone can find a way of looking at it that makes them feel better. Yeah. Yeah. That helped. It, 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 it helped. And it'll, it'll um, be nice to be able to go in uh, the dojo tomorrow uh, with kind of a, almost a sense of relief, you know, like a, a, a piece about it mm. and start working toward uh, some of the curriculum uh, that I had been putting off for some time uh, and start focusing on it. So it's funny because uh, I shouldn't say this over the air, but uh, <laughs> some of my passwords are showed on 2020. Oh, okay. so okay. You, you might know, have to change those line, now, but yeah, I, think yeah. I think that tells us a lot about you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it sounds like on some level, on a deeper level, you understand that this is warranted, that this is deserved and you're overthinking. You're looking, probably overthinking. Well, you sound like my wife. I'm overthinking it. Yes. <laughs> You're looking for outside validation. And the irony yeah. is the outside yeah. validation is what you're struggling with. Uh, uh, well said. Well so you, said. You got yes. to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and pick, pick the one that's healthy. Let's do that one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's you know, right. you're well, going to have to update us. You're welcome. You're going to have to update us when this happens so we can you know, drop some photos in the show notes because I, I think. I have a feeling that people are going to listen to this and want some closure for you. Yeah, good. Going to, Great. They're going to want to see you with that black belt around your waist. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know what you thought about today's episode, but I enjoyed it. I had a great time talking to Mr. Angelo, and I heard from him after that our conversation was helpful. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Now, if you like this format, if there are questions that you'd like to tackle on the air with me, drop me an email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Let's explore a topic, and if it seems to make sense, we'll bring you on the air. We'll talk about it, see if we can help you and everyone else. If you want to follow us on social media, we're at Whistlekick everywhere you can imagine. And don't forget, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, as well as Whistlekick.com. Sign up for the newsletter, save 15% with the code PODCAST15, and just in general, support us if you can, if you're able to. But if nothing else, knowing that you enjoy this show, that's more than enough. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for your support. And until the next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 